Android 11 is among us, and even though it's not in its final stages, there are still so many new changes dripped around the UI. Today I'm going to show you almost every one of them, so you can complain to me in the comments how you're still on Android 9 Pie. It's going to be a fun one. However, before I do, if you'd prefer to watch my videos in Spanish, be sure to check out my second channel called How To Men In Espanol. Almost every one of my most popular Android tutorials and reviews are on there. Anyways, I'm currently rocking the latest Android 11 version, developer preview 4 on my Google Pixel 4 XL. Google did post a full timeline of its preview releases to get a basic idea of when to expect each new update and the final release date. Developer preview 4 seems to be the latest alpha version before we start to receive beta releases, and it's looking like June 3rd will be the set release date for the first beta, so be on the lookout for that. Now the way I wanted to break down this video is first I wanted to show off all the big features first, and then discuss most of the smaller changes. The first big feature is that Android 11 supports a native screen recorder. It took them a while, but better late than never. It can be enabled through a quick setting tile called screen record and using it is pretty straightforward. You just tap on it and a menu will pop up asking if you'd like to also record your voice with the microphone and show touches on the screen. Once you hit start, a three second countdown will begin in the status bar and then your screen will be captured at around 60 frames per second with a low bit rate. Then once you want to stop recording, you just tap the big red notification. Pretty straightforward and nicely implemented. The footage does look a bit glitchy after doing some fast action scrolling due to the low bit rate, but hopefully in a future beta release, they can increase the bit rate, including the option to record at 90 frames per second and provide the option to record the internal audio. While we're on the topic of screen capturing, the screenshot animation has changed and when you take one, you immediately get two options. Share the screenshot or edit it. It's pretty neat and you no longer receive a notification of that screenshot. However, what I'm most excited about is expandable screenshots to capture an entire conversation or web page. It hasn't been released yet, but there are clear hints from both XDA and Android Police that this feature is coming soon, so thumbs up for that. The next prominent change is the power menu has turned into a smart hub for home automation controls and quick access to Google Pay. You still get your normal power options down below, but up top you'll also be able to see and use all of your credit cards. And as of right now, the home automation controls aren't yet available to use, but an XDA developer managed to put together a quick video that demos a working interface. In that demo, they were able to add the controls such as a slider for controlling the brightness for a light bulb and a random custom created button. But after looking at the API documentation, it seems like Google will be supporting a ton of smart devices, including fans, refrigerators, blinds, thermostats, security systems, etc. Moving on, when we jump into the recent screen, you no longer have a dock that opens up the app drawer. Instead, the panels are a lot bigger now and you have three extra buttons at the bottom. The first one is to take a screenshot and the right one is to share the screen. The select button in the middle is to copy words from the panel or to share pictures. In my opinion, it's extremely useful, especially when you're trying to copy and paste words or a picture from an app that doesn't support copy and paste. Lastly, you can bring back closed apps on the recent screen by swiping them away, tapping the home button immediately, and then going back into the recent screen. It's most likely a bug, so hopefully Google is working on a better implementation of this feature. Before I move on to even more exclusive Android 11 features, I wanted to give a huge shout out to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring this video. This is an excellent website for buying a pair of eyeglasses or sunglasses. For starters, they have over 6,000 styles to choose from. So with that many options, you can find any shape, size, color, or frame that you'd like. And you can even make the lenses that have a specialty glass like a blue light or sports glass. I got these pair of eyeglasses from my girlfriend that came with a blue light glass on top and it's been a fantastic add-on since they are designed to protect your eyes from harmful rays of blue light which can be emitted from the screens of any digital device including your smartphone. So in the long run it'll reduce eye strain and enhance visual comfort and it's especially surprising to see how many brands there are on GlassesUSA.com. They range from in-house brands like these which are the eyeglasses I chose to rock since they're so minimal and stylish but they also have ones from designer brands such as Ray-Ban, Gucci, Versace, Oakley, Armani, etc. I went with a pair of Tom Ford which provided a premium and lightweight feel. It's definitely the best pair of sunglasses that I have ever worn. And if you're worried about a pair of glasses looking bad on you while you shop online, there's no need to worry because you can use their virtual mirror tool to let you try on any pair of frames 
and see how they will look on your face by just uploading a picture. You can also add any type of prescription to almost any pair of frames, including sunglasses. And since GlassesUSA.com doesn't have a middleman, they offer prescription glasses at up to 70% off the retail price, making every eyewear really affordable. For example, a pair of glasses, both frames and lenses, start at only 30 bucks with a free basic prescription lens. So if you're wanting to get a new pair of eyeglasses or sunglasses during this pandemic without leaving the house, be sure to use my link in the description and you'll also get a 65% discount off your first pair of basic lenses when you sign up using my personal link. Anyways, back to Android 11 and I'll be rocking these the entire time. <laughs> Let's check out the launcher. There aren't a whole lot of changes here. The app drawer pull-up indicator is a lot bigger now. The home screen has a jiggly animation when switching between screens. And within the styles and wallpapers page, there is a tab for customizing the clock for the always on display. You can also make your icons have a hexagon or a cloud looking background when you create a custom theme. And the wallpaper chooser also got an improved layout, but I didn't get to see the changes on my device, unfortunately. Moving on, it's not an Android update unless Google modifies the notification panel and this time around, they increase the padding between notification sections, giving bigger gaps between each label. I'm personally not a fan of it since it takes up so much space, but what I did like is that they separated every conversation related notification into its own section. So if you receive a text message, it will now be labeled underneath conversations. Hopefully in the future, they can also include notifications from Telegram, Snapchat, or Slack. It's just another way to organize your notification panel. And when you long press those alerts, you'll get an extra setting called priority, which lets you add the notification to the top and it turns any of its new incoming alerts into a notification bubble, similar to that of Facebook Messenger's chat heads. However, the bubbles weren't working for me at the time of this recording, so that in its own is really useful, especially if you have an important conversation to stay on top of. In a future release, it looks like you'll also be able to swipe down from the right side of the status bar to bring down the quick settings panel quickly, while swiping from the left side will bring down your notifications. It's the exact same way with iOS or the Paranoid Android ROM. Finally, you can see your notification history in detail by going to the notification shade, scrolling down to the bottom and selecting history. From there, you can toggle on use notification history. And now every time you dismiss a notification, it will appear on this page. Another way you can see your notification log is by adding the settings shortcut widget to your home screen and then selecting notification log. Before it would just show you the app name and the timestamp. Now you can see the actual notification content, which makes this shortcut a lot more useful. Do not disturb mode is another feature that always gets heavily modified with every new Android release. I'm not sure why Google is never satisfied with its current layout, but once again, every menu has shifted around. The real new features, however, include app exceptions, which basically allows certain apps to push notifications when do not disturb mode is enabled. I mean, this is beautiful because I tend to message most of my friends through Snapchat or Instagram, and now I can actually know when they send a message at night when do not disturb mode automatically gets enabled. Another new feature is that you can now only allow certain conversation to interrupt you. This includes the notifications that you set as a priority before it was just allowing start contacts to interrupt you, but now you can enable group chats to overwrite do not disturb mode as well. As for permissions, background locations have gotten a lot more stricter. Whenever an app requests to view your location, you can select only this time, whereas before it had the option to allow access all the time. If you want to give it location access at all times, you can still do so within the system settings. And let's say you haven't used an app for a really long time, I'm talking months without opening it. If that app has been granted various permissions for anything, those same permissions automatically get revoked after months of inactivity and you'll be able to re-enable them again once you reopen the app. Lastly, if an app keeps requesting access to the same permission more than two times and you keep denying it each time, Android 11 will automatically block it from asking again. So those are all the significant changes that I wanted to review. Now let's do a speed run of a few minor changes that are worth mentioning. First off, airplane mode no longer turns off Bluetooth if you have a Bluetooth device connected. It only turns it off when Bluetooth is not being used. Within the developer options, there's a new feature that shows you the display refresh rate in the top left corner of the screen, sort of like the frat program on computers, so you'll know exactly when the display is at 60 or 90 Hertz. When connecting a Bluetooth device in the developer options, you can now see the supported audio codecs for your headphones. This is because the menu now disables all the options that aren't supported. 
Sound notifications will now be muted while you're recording videos in the default camera app. You just have to give it do not disturb access. There are two new display cutout options within the developer options that support waterfall displays and punch hole screens. When toggling the waterfall one, the edges get cut off completely, most likely to make any waterfall screen easier to use without any accidental palm touches. And lastly, Android 11 now fully supports wireless ADB and ethernet tethering through an adapter. Anyways, those are most of the new changes found within Android 11 so far, or Android R. I didn't review every little feature found within this update since there are so many. Still, I'll include a link in the description to an Android Please article where Ryan Hager updates the list continuously with any new features that are found or released. If you'd like to flash this update manually, I'll include a link in the description to a tutorial on how to do it. As of right now, only Pixel devices or the Essential phone are supported. But keep in mind that by early June, Google will most likely enable their Android beta program so you can receive the update through the air. And lastly, I do want to mention that if you have a Pixel 4, reverting back to Android 10 after installing the Android 11 update will break the face unlock feature. So only install it if you're willing to deal with the, all the bugs that it has and if you're planning to stay on it until the next stable release arrives. Either way, that's a full rundown of Android 11 on the Google Pixel 4 XL. If you enjoyed it, make sure to drop a huge thumbs up on this video, get subscribed with the notification bell turned on and follow me on Instagram or Twitter at HowToMen for some other smartphone content. Also, don't forget to check out GlassesUSA.com through the link in the description for a nice pair of affordable eyeglasses or sunglasses. Thank you guys for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Kapow!